death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. These are the words of the Lord to us this morning, the Lord who desires and has won our victory through Jesus Christ. And so let's worship him as we gather this morning. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful
And please be seated. The church. As you've probably noticed by now, we launched our new website in the spring. Our goal is to create an online experience that allows you to access the information you need as clearly and easily as possible. So I wanted to take a moment to share with you a few important places to know about. If you're new to BlackRock, we have a whole menu item just for you. You can fill out our connect form, find out about our upcoming open house, or even learn about what it means to have a life of faith. The new hub to get information about upcoming events, find sign-up links, or check out major updates is on our events and info page. That page will provide you with a quick overview of each item and a link to take the next step. Hover over the card with your mouse or tap the image on mobile. You can also get there directly by visiting blackrock.org info. At BlackRock, we want everyone to worship in a service, connect in a group, and serve on a team. So we've made it easy for you to do those things. On our groups page, you can see our different group types and sign up for one. Not on a serving team yet? Use our Serve Finder to easily filter through serving opportunities to discover a position that's right for you. You can learn more about what our ministries have going on, request prayer, and watch our services live online. You can also catch up on messages that you missed. And as always, you can easily give your offering online by clicking Give. There you can set up a one-time gift or recurring gift. No account needed. Well, thanks for letting me show you around. We hope our new site is a valuable tool for you and we invite you to spend some time looking around on it. Good morning, BlackRock. How are you guys doing? Good. Well, my name is Treadwell, and I am so glad to be with you here this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements. One, I hope you guys found that uh, video helpful, and they have just done a full redesign on our website. So we want to keep you guys connected so that you guys can stay in the know. Uh, so definitely play around on there if you haven't already. Also, that group finder tool is going to be really helpful this fall for you. If you haven't signed up for a group already, um, it'll help you narrow down uh, what group is right for you and your schedule and your family. Um, and yeah, I just want to encourage you, if you haven't signed up yet, definitely consider doing so. Um, if we've learned anything over the last year and a half, it's how important it is to stay connected to each other. And so um, we learn when we're together and we grow uh, better together. So definitely sign up for a group this fall. Also, um, if you are a guest and you're watching this online, we just say to say welcome. Uh, we're so glad that you're tuning in. Uh, if you go to the website blackrock.org and fill out that connect form, we would love to follow up with you and help you connect. And if you're here this morning and you're new, we actually have a team outside at the guest connections tables out there uh, on the left-hand side of the Welcome Center. Um, our team would just love to meet you and hear a little bit about your story. And we also have a gift for you as well. So definitely stop by there at the end of the service. Uh, last but certainly not least, um, we're going to transition into a time of giving. And I just want to say I am so inspired by the way that we are giving and the way that we are generous here at Black Rock Church with our, um, our time, with our talent, and our finances. Um, it says in 2 Corinthians that God loves when we give from our heart. Um, that it's not about pressure, it's not about obligation, but that God loves a cheerful giver. And it's so amazing to be a part of a church that really models that out so well. So thank you for the way that you guys give uh, faithfully and out of your heart. Um, there are a couple different ways that you can give. Uh, one way is by giving online, as you saw in the video. And then the second way is we have some boxes there um, in the back, and you can drop your gift in there. Let's pray for our offering. Um, God, we are just so thankful for everything that you've blessed us with. And I just pray that this offering, God, would just be multiplied, that it would just make a difference, God, uh, what you're doing here through the church locally, but also all around the world. God, we're just so thankful uh, for what you're doing, God. Also pray for all of our men uh, who are on the retreat this weekend. Um, God, I pray that they would just be refreshed in your presence. Um, God, that they would just come back. Uh, just with a renewed uh, sense of your presence and your love, and it would just be an amazing uh, finish to the weekend today. Bring him back safe, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Thank you, Treadwell. As we do that, would you stand once again to your feet as we prepare to sing?
two songs together. And just before we sing, um, I just want to give you a chance to stand in the quietness this morning before God, to turn your attention of your eye and your heart even further toward him, to help put away those distractions from the week uh, past that might be still weighing on your heart and on your mind this morning, and truly ask God that he would become the center of your vision this morning. Let's do that now.
That is the coolest music I'll ever walk out to in my life. I feel like I'm going to go into like a mixed martial arts fight, not a sermon. Good morning to all of you here today. Good morning to those of you joining us online. Uh, my name is Stephen James Johnson. I'm one of the pastors here at Black Rock. Not to be confused with Pastor Steve. I am Pastor Stephen. The waistline should tell us apart. Anyway, good morning. Welcome to the second sermon in our two-part mini-series entitled Fighting Spiritual Battles. Last week, Pastor Steve discussed uh, the offensive tactics, moving forward in spiritual battles. And this week, I will conclude our brief series in talking about defensive tactics and how we can claim ground and victory in spiritual battles by putting on the armor of God. I'd like to start uh, from the beginning of this sermon, that the topic of spiritual warfare generates a lot of interests, a lot of questions, a lot of debates. It's incredibly natural to be curious about the supernatural. God gives us a wealth of information in the scriptures about the supernatural, and I just want to make something clear. All that we need to know to walk victoriously in obedience to the Lord is in the Bible. It's there for us to learn. There's no secret or hidden knowledge. Our supernatural faith is not centered on angels or demons or our own personal victory. Our faith is focused on Jesus Christ, who supernaturally was God, who took on human flesh, who lived a sinless life and took the punishment for our sins, who absorbed the wrath of God and that punishment and judgment that was due to us and defeated Satan and death so that all who believe in him might not ever perish but have everlasting life. There is only one name that gets glory from this platform, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. Now, there are 12 points in my sermon Anybody who's ever taken a preaching class just got really nervous, all right? I'm going to see if I can do 12 points for a message within the time frame that I'm given. And at the start of this message, we'll go with point number one when we we're talking about the armor of God. And before we get into our passage, the first point is that Jesus has already won. Ephesians 1, 20 to 23, and the scripture should be up there for you, tells us that Jesus is seated far above all rule, far above every authority, every power, every dominion. He has already won the war. He is seated high and lifted up. All things are under his rule. He is above every power and every authority and every spirit, and that is a reality now and in the age to come. Any opposition forces against Jesus Christ are fighting a losing battle. And Pastor Steve emphasized last week, but by means of reminder, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, point number two, you have already won in Jesus. Ephesians 2 tells us that we were dead in sin, but he made us alive in Jesus. He saved us by his grace, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus' work on the cross is so effective that he saves us not only from sin and the resultant judgment, but to being a co-heir, a co-ruler with Jesus. As we study today's passage, we must remember we fight from a place of victory. Now that doesn't mean that we don't fight Look at the end of the passage in Ephesians 2. It tells us that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has prepared for us in advance to do. And to complete that mission, to be obedient to that calling, we must go and advance into spiritual battles. And if we are obedient to the instructions given to us in Ephesians 6, we will experience victory in those spiritual battles. And that leads us to our passage for this morning reading from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the devil's schemes. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, over spir- against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer of supplication. So let's dig into this scripture passage. Whenever you see, here's a little Bible study hint for you, whenever you see a finally or a therefore, you should be asking, hey, what's that therefore? Go back and read the stuff that came before it because there's a crucial context that we need to read. Paul has given us many instructions and lessons for Christian living in the book of Ephesians. He writes to us finally, literally in the Greek meaning for the rest because he's expecting us to obey everything that he's taught us in the first five chapters of this book. Here are some instructions in Ephesians about Christian unity and Christian conduct and truthfulness. He explains to us more about the gospel. He gives us the structure of the Christian home, how we're to relate to one another in Christian relationships. He expects us to put all of those things into action. Then he says, for the rest... Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. If we're going to go into spiritual battle, point number three, a key element to our victory is obedience. We cannot expect to see spiritual victory if we're voluntarily signing up for defeat by choosing sin. Obedience to the Lord is a command throughout all of the scriptures. From the first page to the last page, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The Apostle James teaches us to be doers of the word, not only hearers, or will deceive ourselves. In 1 Samuel, we read, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of God? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to listen better than the fat of rams. Many spiritual battles we face if not most of them, can be defended against through obedience. The armor of God that that Paul instructs us to put on is not defensive weaponry that we use while we simultaneously, offensively maneuver ourselves into pathways of spiritual uh, opposition and disobedience. It would be like getting pulled over for a speeding ticket knowing that you're wrong, and then praying this armor of God against the speeding ticket. Now, I'd be a hypocrite if I hadn't said I've done that, because I think I have. But we, we cannot use the armor of God as a way to escape consequences. Obedience is one of the most effective weapons. We are then told to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Now, I am an old school guy. I'm a millennial, I don't know if that makes any of you nervous, uh, but I'm a millennial, but I'm an old school one. I am a guy who believes in hard work and in investing blood, sweat, and tears into what you love, into what you're passionate about, and seeing results. But Paul is clear. We are saved by grace through faith, not by works, not our own doing. We did nothing to earn our salvation. We were chosen before the foundations of the world. We receive because God has gifted us. It should blow our minds, cause ultimate humility to think that God is even mindful of us. Our spiritual victory is not done in our own strength either. Paul is not teaching us to dig deep, to find strength deep inside of us. He's not saying to go out there. This isn't a motivational talk, all right? This isn't a Disney sports movie. This is spiritual warfare. The actual text here is to be strengthened, meaning the strength comes from outside of ourselves. Only when we are positioned in the Lord, in union with him, do we have power to overcome our spiritual enemy. Jesus says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. 
Apart from me, you can do nothing. Be strong in the Lord. Be certain in the Lord. And then he tells us immediately thereafter so that we might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Notice Paul's instruction here is to stand. He's teaching us to stand our ground. And the equipment he's about to list off for us is defensive equipment. It's defensive armor. We're not instructed to go pursue spiritual battles. But let's be clear. If we are walking in obedience, and if, think about Pastor Steve's sermon from last week. If we are living in obedience and making impacts for Jesus Christ in our communities, in our lives, you don't need to worry about finding spiritual battles they will present themselves to you. But we are instructed to stand. And that instruction requires us to firstly, be obedient in our relationship with Jesus. And secondly, to decide in advance where our loyalties lie. Because the moment of spiritual battle is not the moment to decide that you're going to stand. We must already have our minds made up we cannot be wishy-washy about our faith, about unrighteousness, about sin, and so forth. We are called to decide now how we will stand so that on the day of battle, we are prepared to stand. Key point number four, decide now to stand against the schemes of the devil. Don't be ambivalent about your spiritual loyalties. Paul goes on to write that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of, over this present darkness, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's time to name our enemy, and Paul does. Now, there are a couple of errors that folks fall into, I find, well, when we read this passage. Firstly, they'll make every insult hurt, sorrow, some event that happens in their lives, a, a spiritual. It'll make everything a direct satanic oppression. Now, the Bible is filled with instructions for us on how we're to relate to others. It tells us how to handle when we're wronged. It tells us how to handle when we've wronged others. It tells us how to interact with others lovingly. It tells us how we are to treat one another and regard one another. Don't let this verse be a scapegoat for our failure to have to set emotionally healthy boundaries. So this verse is not what we like, hey, this person did this to us, but that was really saying, I don't need to hold that person accountable, right? That's how we, we actually don't see spiritual growth or sanctification in the church because we, we use this verse as a scapegoat and we don't actually hold each other accountable. But I want to be clear, Satan can certainly use people. He can certainly use things that have been said to you and in your life. In my life, I have had repeated episodes of being told that I'm not good enough, that I'm not man enough, that I'll amount to nothing, that I shouldn't even bother trying, that things were spoken into my life that if I believed them would be incredibly paralyzing. Now, I have to maintain relationships with those people who said those things. I still have to process forgiveness. I still have to have healthy boundaries. But certainly, the enemy of our souls could use those lies to lead me down a path apart and away from God. Don't lean to one extreme or the other. Maintain healthy boundaries, but also know the source of your opposition. The other error that people will make is to study their enemy more than they study the God who has victory over the enemy. The United States Secret Service is responsible for investigating counterfeit currency. And the first thing they do when they're training on recognizing bad dollar bills is to familiarize themselves so intimately with the real one. Spend time knowing your God. Spend time building relationship with him, building up your armor. Study your Bible, not your enemy. All you need to know your enemy, about your enemy is in the Bible, and the Bible tells us to resist him, not study him. Key truth number five, be intimate with your victorious God and resist your defeated enemy. Scripture passages go, goes on to say, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And he tells us to stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes for your feet, the readiness given by the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. And what's interesting is when we get to this place, we suddenly become very mystical. 
seems to be a theme that we're it's really practical, and then we hear about the armor of God, and we get very, very mystical. And I, I know of a friend of mine who w- would not be able to leave his house until he prayed through this verse and applied each of these verses because he was too fearful that if he didn't pray through the verse that he would not have God on his side. He would not have any safety from spiritual law oppression. And what I find is interesting about that is it assumes that a man cannot be tempted in his own home, all right? And that's kind of a, a, a funny thing if you think about it because I know that, I mean, the takeout delivery comes to my house. I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> he missed the whole point of the passage. The armor of God is not a magical prayer. It's not an incantation. It's not a spell. It's not any type of uh, pagan thing that we've integrated into Christianity. The very need to put on armor suggests to us that battle is coming our way. We cannot avoid spiritual battles. The the instructions to put on the armor of God tells us there's offenders coming to take ground from us. Jesus promises us this kind of trouble. Talk about Bible promises. The armor of God is not a literal outfit you put on. Paul is illustrating to us How, in addition to our secure position of victory in Christ Jesus, and in addition to our obedience to God, we are to ever be ready for spiritual battles. He tells us to put on the belt of truth. Now, the belt of truth, the belt is what holds the whole armor together. Uh, Many of you know I'm the associate pastor of public safety chaplaincy. I work in public safety full time. And in the jobs that I have, some of those I have to wear a duty belt with all the gear on it and all that kind of stuff. Let me tell you of a time that I was wearing that duty belt and it was not firmly fastened. And when I needed to run and move quickly in pursuit of something, that belt fell immediately to the ground along with my pants. Now, that is not going to be a really effective strategy, right? Because my belt's not secured. I'm going to be, one, pretty embarrassed, but, you know, you overcome that, I guess. But secondly, that our, the belt's not secured. The rest of everything falls apart. Be so secure in the truth of the gospel. Be so secure in the truth of God's word. Psalm 119 says that the entirety of God's word is truth. Jesus is the truth. That's what John 14, 6 tells us. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Philippians 4, 8 tells us to fill our minds with the truth. When you fill your mind with the truth, you will not fall victim to the lies of the evil one. When deceptive doctrine comes your way, you'll recognize it for what it is, a trick of the devil. Be so familiar with the truth of God that when anything outside of that truth presents itself to you, you immediately recognize it as false. Point number six, the basis of all of your spiritual victory is how much your mind is filled with and convinced of biblical truth. Moving on, we're to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is uprightness and integrity of character. Righteousness flows from a heart and life permeated with the truth of Jesus Christ. But whose righteousness do we bear? It's clear to us, Ephesians 4 tells us we're new creations in Christ. The old self is dead. Put on the new. But that can often lead us to legalism, that if I do all the right things and say all the right things, and then therefore I'm protected. No, 1 Corinthians 1.30 makes it clear that Jesus is our righteousness. We are righteous because of Jesus. Therefore, we do righteous. But it is Christ's righteousness that keeps us and guards us. When you walk in the righteousness and integrity of Christ, false accusations, temptations to darkness, they don't work against you. Sin breeds more sin. But when the enemy comes to lead you astray and you value righteousness and you value integrity, the appeal of deceit, the appeal of impurity will not exist. Point number seven, walk as children of the light so you will not be attracted to the darkness. In this position, defensive position that we're in, your footwear is incredibly important. I teach new EMTs. I run an EMT uh, education program, and I have to tell them, hey, you got to get really good boots. You got to get something that protects you, that goes above your ankles. We step in disgusting stuff. You don't want to get inside your shoe. You need to be protected in case you're you're lifting someone and you do one of these numbers and you don't roll your ankle. You got to be ready. What if something comes up that's sharp and tries to puncture your foot? You need really good boots. And Paul gives us this instruction and says, hey, 
Be equipped with the readiness, or better translated, the preparation of the gospel of peace. Is the gospel your firm foundation? Are your feet secure in the truth and knowledge of Jesus? There's times we have to move quickly. Uh, This scene is not safe. We need to retreat. We need to be ready to move. Are you prepared to move and to obey and to go as being planted in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Point number eight, maintain the gospel as your firm foundation. Paul then instructs us to take up the shield of faith with, with, with which we can extinguish all the flaming darts or arrows of the evil one. Note that this is the only time that Paul says how effective a piece of the armor is. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, faith is not something we conjure up of our own. Remember, Ephesians 2, we've been gifted faith by God through Christ Jesus. But the faith that we've been given, we can most certainly nurture. We can nurture our faith through prayer, through studying the Word of God, through asking God to show us His love and power in our lives, and seeing demonstrations of His might, and seeing answered prayer. We can worship together. We can listen to our brothers and sisters share what God is doing in their lives. We can attend church services like this one, where the Word of God is proclaimed. We can connect in a group, and so we can spur one another on in good works. The Bible tells us to recall all of what God has done for us. This builds our faith. Nurture the faith that God has gifted you. And you know what's interesting about this piece of armor? It's the only one that moves around. Because the flaming darts of the evil one are coming from all directions. Everything else is secured and fastened on. But if this were to be my little shield here, whatever dart of the evil one comes my way, I'm able to stop it because my faith tells me that these things are not true about me. These situations are not valid, right? So this faith, and it extinguishes the flame, right? So the point of the flame is to burn you up once it hits you. It doesn't just stop the dart. It extinguishes all the impact of the dart. That our faith in Christ is what allows us to believe and walk in power and in successful resistance to the lies of the devil. Number nine, nurture your faith in God and recall his faithfulness to you. Then the helmet of salvation. You know what's interesting about the helmet of salvation? It says take up, but the rest of the armor is laid out for the soldier. He goes and puts it all on and fastens himself up. But the helmet actually had to be placed upon him because he couldn't do it at this point. There's too much armor on And so it says, take up, or better translated, receive the helmet of salvation. That's interesting, because it's not anything we do to save ourselves, but Jesus Christ, who gifts us salvation. If we've not received salvation, if we've not placed our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if we're not walking and surrender to his lordship, spiritual victory is impossible, because it's not in your own strength, it's in the strength of God. Point number 10. Repent for the forgiveness of sins. Surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. That is the only way for victory. And if you have done this, we can continue to repent and ask God to expose to us areas of our lives perhaps we've not yet surrendered. The last piece of armor is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the only truly offensive piece of the armor. I want to be clear here. This is very important. We are told our weapon against spiritual forces of darkness is the word of God. Please note, there is no magical phrase, no incantation, no formula. We don't have to say something three times. We don't have to say something in a specific order. Spiritual warfare is not witchcraft or mysticism with a cross on it. We should be careful not to create false doctrines about how to fight demons based upon things we've read maybe in some not-so-Christian books that somehow still fill Christian book sections, or preachers who are using extra-biblical sources going outside of the Word of God to create doctrine for us. Sometimes I think we base our faith on, on, and our understanding on the supernatural based upon what we've seen on television and so forth. We should be building our doctrines upon the Scriptures. Friends, when Satan was tempting Jesus in the desert, do you know what Satan did? He took Bible verses and he took them out of context. He twisted them, misapplied them, and tempted Jesus to act sinfully based upon those misinterpretations of the scriptures. Satan knows the Bible. 
so you should too. We are given one weapon to tear down strongholds of error and falsehood. One weapon to combat the twisting of, our, of the truth our enemy is so famously known for. Accurate understanding and application of the word of God. That is how Jesus defeated Satan in the desert. We will model our spiritual warfare after our master. When you hear a lie about your identity, a false doctrine, an accusation, have your sword ready. Key point number 11, fill your mind, heart, and mouth with the word of God. And lastly, point number 12, we're told to be in prayer always. Be a person of prayer. Pray at all times in the Spirit. Paul is telling us our lives to, are to be characterized by prayer. Throughout all of these circumstances, we are to pray. Prayer connects us to the Lord. It aligns our heart with his will. God ordains prayers as a method by which he accomplishes his purposes in the world. Commune with God. Spend time with God. Before him, delight in his presence. We can pray about anything and everything, and we're instructed to do that. And to that end, there will be folks in the prayer room after this service to pray with you and to pray for you. Friends, the armor of God is the gift we are given from the Lord to fight spiritual battles. But the armor of God wrongly applied is ineffective. We want us all to see spiritual victory. So rest in your most victorious Savior. This last slide will be all 12 points. If you missed any of them, you could take a picture of them. Uh, whatever it might be, and let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you are a good, good God. We give you thanks that you are wonderful and compassionate and gracious, and that you've given us all that we need to experience victory in spiritual battles. Help us to put on the armor of God in a way that truly prepares us so that we would be ever ready for spiritual warfare, and that when it comes our way, we can boldly uh, declare and experience and walk in victory that comes only by the matchless name of Jesus Christ. And it's by his name I pray. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to be sent back out into the week ahead that may be filled with spiritual battles at every turn, would you stand as we cement these truths from God's word into our hearts this morning as we sing one last song together?
we may overcome through Christ alone and stand complete at last. Father God, that is the desire and the cry of our hearts this morning. And so would you send us out, fitted with your armor, for all that you may have in store for us this week. Remember, those men and women in the prayer room are ready to receive you now. And may you go fully protected by the armor of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.